We're in a series on Sunday morning entitled Serve, 40 Days of Irresistible Influence. When I came a few years ago, we began to try to define what it means to be a disciple. If the church is called to make disciples, then we have to know what a disciple is. And the best that we could do in our own human understanding, we put together a a system, a process, a paradigm that helps us answer the question, what is a disciple? And so for us at Second, we've said a disciple is one who'll connect grow and serve. And here's what we mean when we say that. A disciple will connect with God in worship. That's corporate worship and personal private worship. A disciple will grow in the faith. That's personal growth and that's growing with other believers in life groups, Sunday school classes, getting connected, growing in accountability. And a disciple will serve. You'll serve in ministry within the church and in mission beyond the church. And so what does it mean to be a disciple? One who faithfully, consistently connects, grows, and serves the Lord in the context of the local body of Christ. And so we're in a series, Serve, as we're emphasizing this year, the year of serve. In 2014, we talked about connect, 40 days of passionate worship. In 2015, we talked about grow, 40 days of spiritual disciplines. And so, for this six or seven weeks, we unite together as a church in unity of vision and purpose, in unity of understanding, coming together as the body of Christ to focus on what it means to serve the Lord faithfully in the church and beyond the church. Now, I'm excited. I told you last week. Some of you were traveling, you might not have heard. The next few weeks are going to be incredible here at Second. Next Sunday, we honor our first responders. Kelvin Cochran will be with us. Kelvin Cochran was the Atlanta fire chief that was terminated from his position by the mayor of Atlanta, Kasim Reed, for his stance on traditional marriage. Kelvin will be with us next week and will be preaching the sermon and We'll honor our first responders. I'm looking forward to that. Then the week after that, we'll honor our teachers. We'll honor our school system employees as school will start July 29th. And then the week after that, I told you that last week, I've been holding this and I'm so excited. I even talked to Coach Mike Chastain just last week. The new coach at Warner Robins High School, Mike Chastain, asked us as a church if we would help send the entire football team in Warner Robins High School to FCA camp. You know what FCA camp is? You know Daryl McElwain, who is a member, faithful servant of the Lord here at Second, who leads that ministry throughout middle Georgia, fellowship of Christian athletes. So we get, as a church body, to send an entire football team from Warner Robins High School to an FCA camp, and they'll be with us on August 7th. You'll get to hear from a ball player or two. You'll get to see them. Our students will do a lunch for them uh, on August 7th. What an incredible opportunity and privilege on our part to be able to do that. Isn't that awesome? I'm excited about that. I am looking forward to it. I'm thrilled. Now, some of you out there are like, I wonder, Robbins High School, I'm a Northside Eagle, right? I'm a Veterans War Hawk. I'm a Houston County Bear. I'm a Westfield Hornet. I'm a Perry Panther. I get it, okay? I understand, right? But the love of Jesus transcends all the sports teams, right? Even you Georgia Tech people. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Paul says, I became all things to all people so that some might be saved, right? So we have an awesome opportunity to do that as a church, and I'm, I'm thrilled. Today, we're in Psalm 103. Psalm 103, as we talk about this subject, the idea of serving your family, serving your family. We've talked about what it means to serve the Lord. We've talked about what it means to serve our country we talked about what it means to serve the church, and today, serving your family. And, and can I say, after serving the Lord, this is the most important aspect of serving that we must understand as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to serve my family? This is the most important priority, and moms and dads, listen carefully, this is your most important ministry. How can I serve my family? Today we'll look at Psalm 103, but we'll we'll look at the entire psalm through the message. But I'll focus on 
just reading at this moment verses 17 to 19. Psalm 103, we'll read verse 17 to verse 19. Begin reading with me. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Remember this morning the powers and the perfect word of God. And to that we ought to add our amen. Amen. The Lord established his throne and his kingdom rules over all. According to a study of more than 500 family counselors, the following are some top traits of what they would say are successful families. First of all, communicating and listening. Secondly, affirming and supporting family members. Third, respecting one another. Fourth, developing a sense of trust. Fifth, sharing time and responsibility. Six, knowing right from wrong. Seven, having rituals and traditions. Eight, sharing a religious core. Nine, respecting privacy. Now, I don't want to be rude to 500 family counselors who figured out the traits of successful families, but I want to add one that I think trumps them all. Here's the trait of a successful family. It's a family that loves Jesus. It's a family that lives by the Word. It's a family that serves the Lord. That is what matters most. I heard about a young couple who purchased new appliances for their home. And the wife called her mom and said, Mom, we've got brand new appliances here. And I know you've been needing a refrigerator, so we will send you our refrigerator. They live a long way away. And so not only did they give her mom the refrigerator, they shipped it, which cost almost as much as another refrigerator. The mom called her daughter on the phone and said, Sweetheart, this is so kind. I cannot believe that you gave us this refrigerator. Please let us write you a check. No way, Mom. You're not going to pay us for this refrigerator. It's yours. It's a gift. Sweetheart, I know that you could have sold this refrigerator and you could have made a lot of money. And then you spent a lot of money to send it to us. Please let me pay you for the refrigerator. Daughter thought for a moment and said, Mom, just let this be payment for all those years that you took care of me when I lived at home with you. Silence on the other end of the line. The mom replied, in that case, the refrigerator doesn't cover it. <laughs> Family is an interesting thing, right? I mean, if we wanted to have uh, volunteers at the end of the service and we wanted to say all the perfect families hang out right here afterward, guess what would happen? Everybody would be gone to Cracker Barrel. Everybody would be gone to Shoney's. Is that even a thing? Everybody would be gone to Sonny's. Everybody would be gone all over the place. There are no such things as perfect families. But the reality is the Word of God gives us guidelines. Now, Psalm 103 is not necessarily known to be a text about the family. But what we're going to do is take some principles from this text and apply it to the family. And here's the phrase, an idea I want you to remember. Multi-generational faithfulness. I want you to hang your hat on that now. Multi-generational faithfulness. Not just one generation serving the Lord but multiple generations serving the Lord. There's a phrase in here, Psalm 103. There's a phrase that says, His righteousness to children's children. Generation after generation, seeing the goodness of God and following the Lord Jesus Christ and serving Him faithfully. That's what we desire to see as a family, and that's what we desire to see as a church. Let's dive in and talk about your home as we consider this idea of serving your family. First of all, your home should be driven by love. Driven by love. You ought to love the Lord. You ought to love one another. And you ought to love others. Now, as you read the Psalms, I want you to understand some Psalms are addressed and spoken to other people. Some Psalms are addressed and spoken to the Lord. And then this psalm, it's very interesting, David speaks not to someone else and not to the Lord. David is talking to himself in this psalm. You ever done that before? People think you're crazy. 
David's talking to himself. What does he say? Bless the Lord, O my soul. He's speaking in the first person and he's speaking to himself. God is worthy to be praised. He's reminding himself of the goodness, the grace, the love, and the mercy of God. And throughout this psalm, we see David recognizing the love of God and wanting to pass that love on to others. Look back, verse 10 of Psalm 103, and read with me verses 10 to 14. And listen to how he describes the love, goodness, and grace of God. These are some incredible verses. Speaking of God, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Amen. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. What incredible verses that speak to us of the love and the grace and the mercy of God. It's interesting in the Bible. Here he doesn't say, as far as the north is from the south, God separates our sin. Because you realize if you keep traveling north and you go over the North Pole, guess what's going to happen? You're going to start traveling south. There's a point where north and south meet. What does he say? As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed our sin from us. East and west never meet. That is the great love of God. Our homes ought to be a place of love, and it ought to be centered first and foremost on God's love, his faithful love towards us. It's interesting, as a father shows compassion to his children, the Lord shows compassion on those who fear him. This is a picture of the family of God and the picture of a godly family. Our homes should be driven by love. Look at what it says in verse 17. The Lord, the Bible says here, the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear Him, to those who love Him, to those who worship Him. God's love is faithful and never ending. David looks back throughout history in the past and he sees that God's love is eternal and everlasting. David looks at his life here and now in the present and he sees that God's love is always with him. And David looks forward to eternity future and realizes that there will never be a moment when God's love stops. It is from everlasting in the past to everlasting in the future. That's why he says it is the steadfast love of the Lord. It never ends. Someone said the right temperature at home is surely more maintained by warm hearts and cool heads than by those who live there with their thermostats. Isn't that the reality in your home? It's a vacation season. You remember the uh, famous words of Winston Churchill, right? Is immortal words. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight... In the hills. And for some of us, that sounds like our family vacation, doesn't it? Fight here, fight there, fight everywhere. I say our family doesn't really take a vacation unless it's just me and Stephanie. If we take the kids with us, it's not a vacation. It's just moving chaos from one spot to another. That's the way it is. Our homes ought to be driven by love. We ought to love the Lord. We ought to love one another. And we ought to have a love for His church and His mission. Listen to me carefully. If you love Jesus, you'll care about the things he cares about. And so we can't say, I love Jesus, but I'm really not that high on the church. It doesn't work like that. If you love Jesus, you'll love the church. Christ loved the church, died for the church, purchased the church with his own blood, will sanctify the church, one day return for the church, the body of Christ, his bride. You ought to love what Jesus loves. First of all, we ought to be driven by love. Secondly, we ought to be defined by righteousness. Our home should be defined by righteousness. Sadly, these days, our homes are defined by brokenness, not righteousness. By divorce, dysfunction, anger, 
bitterness, confusion, frustration. Sadly, the home is crumbling. The family is falling apart in our society and around the world. Our homes ought to be a place of righteousness. Look what the Bible says here, the latter part of verse 17. And his righteousness to children's children. The righteousness of God. If you had to choose one word to describe your home, could you use that word, righteousness? Could you use that word, faithful? Could you use the word, truth? Here he says, the righteousness of God is communicated, extends out from generation to generation to children's children. To be honest, the real reason it's so hard to bring up children is because they insist on being like their parents. That's the reality. Because there often is so much unfaithfulness and unrighteousness and wickedness. We are all so sinful and fall short of God's standards, but we strive for holiness and righteousness. David says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It extends forever from generation to generation. And the righteousness of God to children's children. I want my kids to know about Jesus because they saw their daddy follow him faithfully. I want my grandkids to know about Jesus because they saw a dad and a mom, a grandmother, a grandfather, a great-grandmother, a great-grandfather, a great-great-grandmother and grandfather who loved the Lord. That ought to be something, the inheritance that we seek to pass on to our kids. Let me just tell you, the best way to transfer faith from one generation to another is the family. That's why the family is under such attack. The hope of the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus entrusted the gospel to the church. The hope of the church is the family. And so you and I are called as families to carry the message. And I realize... I'm a pastor at a church saying the greatest way for faithfulness and righteousness to transfer from one generation to the next is the family. That's what God intends. That's his desire. And the church is here to support you, encourage you, aid you, and help you on that journey. But it starts at home. David says in Psalm 145 and verse 4, One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. What's happening there? Moms and dads are telling their kids about God. That ought to be what happens in your home. The sad reality is to our forefathers, our faith was an experience. To our fathers, faith was an inheritance. To us, it's a convenience. And to our children, it's become a nuisance. That's what we see happening in our society. Is your home defined by righteousness? Let me give you a simple test. We've provided you with devotion books for 42 days. We round down on the 40 days thing, if that's okay. We don't do math here a whole lot, okay? We provided you with devotion books. Are you faithfully following devotions personally? But then we also, each week, just once a week, provide you with a family devotion. So are you sitting around a table or around the living room or on the floor in the playroom or the dining room or maybe out on the porch walking through this together with your family? We've given you a simple way to gather around as a family unit and to talk about what they're hearing in their life groups, what you're hearing in the sermon, what you're hearing in your life group, what you're reading throughout the week, what a simple way. And my hope is that this weekly family devotion, family worship, will turn into faithful every night, as much as possible, family devotions and family worship. That's how we transfer righteousness. Do you spend time together as a family in worship? Serving the family. Are you interested not just in one generation, but multiple generations, what I call multi-generational faithfulness. First of all, our homes should be driven by love. Our homes should be defined by righteousness. The next, our homes should be devoted to obedience. Devoted to obedience. It's not enough to recognize the righteousness of God. It's not enough to thank Him for His endless love. 
It's not enough to recognize His grace and His goodness and His forgiveness of sin. The Bible tells us here we must respond to His love, His righteousness, His grace, and His forgiveness with obedience. The only proper response to the love and the righteousness of Jesus, the only proper response to the love and righteousness He's shown us is obedience. Jesus says, how can you say you love me, but you don't obey me? We love to proclaim how much we love him. But do our actions show that we really do? Your home should be devoted to obedience. And I'm not just talking about children obey your parents. I'm talking about parents obey your Savior. Your home should be marked by obedience. Can I ask you a question? Moms and dads, listen to me carefully. How do children learn that church is optional? They see parents who come only when it's convenient. How do children learn to ignore their Bible? They see their mom and dad maybe take it to church, and if they do, leave it in the car all week. How do children learn to push aside important things? They see parents who put everything else before the Lord. How do children learn to ignore God? They see parents do it every day. Our homes ought to be a place devoted to obedience and faithfulness. The reality is we have so many problems with our kids because they follow our example. They learn by watching. Here David describes those who are faithful to the Lord. How does he describe them? Look at what he says. To those who keep his covenant. To those who remember to do his commandment. What is that? That is obedience. We keep the covenant of the Lord. And we remember to do what he's called us to do. This is simple obedience. Remembering and doing. Maybe in your home it's like mine. Often we give instruction to our children. And those instructions are not followed. I know. You're shocked. We give instructions to our children and those instructions are not followed. But, but in my home, one of the most popular excuses is, I forgot. There's no outright rebellion. It's not like, hey, go clean your room. No, I'm not going to do that. That does not happen. My children have learned that swift and intermittent pressure applied to the backside consistently can change their attitudes. So we don't have this open, outright rebellion. When they say, no, I'm not going to do that. That doesn't happen. Didn't happen in my home growing up either. But what we have is children who comply outwardly, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, but then fail to follow through with what they've said they'll do. And the excuse isn't, I didn't want to. I didn't feel like it. The excuse is, I forgot. It not it amazing? They never forget to do the things they want to do. They forget the thing, to do the things you told them to do. I began to think about that, and I thought, man, we do the same thing to God, don't we? God says, serve the Lord faithfully. Obey his commands. Love one another. Treat others the way you want to be treated. We say, all right, God, we'll get, up, get right on that. Yes, sir, going to take care of it. We'll make that happen. We don't shake our fist to the heavens and say, no way. We just come around later and say, I'm sorry. I forgot. It's amazing how we always find time to do the things we want to do, and we don't forget that. In the end, regardless of your motivation, disobedience is the result. Jesus had something to say about the servant who said he would obey, yet didn't. Ultimately, our homes ought to be devoted to obedience. A pastor from over a century ago named Clovis Chapel told this story about two paddle boats. Two paddle boats left Memphis, Tennessee, were headed down the Mississippi, going to New Orleans. As they traveled safely side by side, sailors from one vessel began to holler across and make remarks about the other vessel's snail's pace. Now, this is street racing before there was street racing. You know what I'm talking about? 
So they begin to talk about back and forth. Your boat's slower. No, your boat's slower. You're going slower than a snail back and forth. Words were exchanged. Challenges were made. And then the race began. Two paddle boats racing on the Mississippi River. Competition became vicious as the boats roared through the deep south down the Mississippi. One boat began to fall behind. They didn't have enough fuel. They had enough fuel to make the journey from Memphis to New Orleans, but they didn't have enough fuel to make the journey by racing. So one industrious sailor had the idea, we'll burn the cargo. We'll take what we have, what we've been assigned to carry, and we'll throw it in and see what happens. They threw in the cargo, and they realized cargo burns as good as coal. And so they began throwing it in, one after the other. They fueled their boat with the material they'd been assigned to carry and transport. They ended up winning the race. But when they got to their destination, they'd burned all their cargo. Can I tell you this morning, God has entrusted us to carry some precious cargo. Children, spouses, family, friends. Our job is to ensure that the cargo reaches its destination. But we keep burning things that are important to get ahead. And one day we're going to look back and realize what we've lost. We, we burn church for sports. We burn our quiet time for sleep. We burn family devotions for television shows. We burn any sense of decency for a new game called Pokemon Go. Did you see video of people running around Central Park in New York with their phones up, doing like that. Man. We burn God's tithes for new toys. What does it look like to be devoted to obedience? Can I just answer that for you? What does it look like? Faithfully attending church. I'm not saying you've got to be here every Sunday. I know that you're going to take vacation, and that's okay. I want you to go, and I want you to enjoy your vacation. But don't tell me that you're committed to the church when you show up once every three months. That's epidemic among the congregations in America today. That's my church. I'm committed. How committed are you when you show up four times a year? How can you grow in relationships? How can you grow in the Word? How can you grow in depth with others following the Lord? You can't. That's not commitment. How do we serve the Lord faithfully? By being a part of the body of Christ, growing in relationships. I'm not saying you've got to be here every Sunday. When you're on vacation, enjoy it. But when you're here, be here. It ought not to be a question in your home whether or not you're going to be at church if you're in town. If your kids have to start shaking you about 8.30, hey, we're we going to church today, mom, dad, is that going to be something we do today? If it's a question in your home, you've already got a problem. Ought to be no question. Ought to be the standard. You set that standard. How do we, how do we faithfully follow the Lord in obedience? Reading the Word. Faithfully, individually, and then as a family, praying together, family worship, serving in the church, talking about God in everything that you do, giving God what He requires, His tithes, and then over and above the tithe, faithfully to the Lord. It, we ought to be devoted to obedience. And then number four, your homes are designed for worship. Your home should be driven by love. Defined by righteousness, devoted to obedience, and driven, excuse me, designed for worship. All of this, everything that we do comes, when it comes down to our family and our relationship with the Lord, this is what matters. It ought to be designed in the end to cause us to worship the Lord. That's it. Look at what he says here in verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. One king, one kingdom that rules over all. One day, 
every nation's leader will bow down and recognize the supreme leader. One day, every justice that sits upon the supreme court will bow down and worship the supreme judge of all the universe. One day, every president of the United States will bow down and recognize Jesus is Lord. One day, every UN leader will say, He alone is king. One kingdom and one king. He rules over all. That's what David says. His throne is established. He is king of kings and Lord of lords. This is the theme of the entire psalm. The theme of the entire psalm is worship. It's like... David's just walking along one day, minding his own business, doing his own thing. Maybe he's playing the harp. Maybe he's watching a sheep. Maybe he's already king. I don't know what's going on. All of a sudden, he just starts thinking about the goodness of God. As he's walking along, minding his own business, Holy Spirit begins to speak. And has that ever happened to you? If not, you need to let it. The Holy Spirit begins to speak to you and begins to work in the life of David. And David begins thinking about the goodness of God. And all of a sudden, he just bursts out, Bless the Lord, O my soul! He is so good to me! Oh my goodness, where would I be without the goodness of the Lord and His graciousness in my life? Listen to what he says, verses 1 to 6. Listen to these words. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all His benefits. Here it is, church, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. That is a good God who deserves our worship and praise. He goes on to say, look at verse 20. Verse 20, verse 21, verse 22. David's not satisfied talking to himself. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his host, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. David's just walking along one day, and he has what I call a Holy Spirit fit. Let me just say, if you've never been overwhelmed by the goodness of God, maybe it's because you haven't received it personally through Jesus. If you know Jesus, there's going to be a moment in your life where you look around and say, My goodness, I don't deserve any of this. He has been so good to me. David was a... Young man, he ran toward the giant and said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. In Revelation chapter 5 and verse 13, the apostle John heard a vast choir of all creation, every nation, tribe, and tongue worshiping the Lord. And one day we will join that anthem. But the final shout of praise in this psalm comes not from the angels, not from the heavenly host, but it comes from the lips of King David himself. Bless the Lord, O my soul. After all, isn't it redeemed men and women that have more to bless his name for than all the hosts of the angels combined? The goodness and grace he's shown us in Jesus. That's what David means when he says the Lord's established his throne. His kingdom rules over all. He's king. He's Lord. He's in charge. We worship him. He's the only one worthy of worship and praise. And this is why God designed the family. This is why it's so important how you define the family. This is why it's so important what marriage is, what a male is, what a female is what a family is because God designed it to turn back to him in praise and worship and to speak of his grace and love. Bless the Lord. Worship him. You know, genuine worship always leads to service. If you love the Lord and you desire to worship Him, do you know what that means? It means you'll serve Him. In fact, the the word in the Greek 
This is why if you read Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, when it talks about this is your reasonable service or your reasonable act of worship, the word service is connected to the word worship in the Greek. You can't separate the words. We have two words in English, but in the Greek it means the same thing. To worship the Lord is to serve Him. You cannot worship Him faithfully without serving Him. That's it. Serving the Lord. Your home, it it ought to be designed. It is designed for worship. And you ought to fulfill that design. Why do we serve the Lord? Because it's an act of worship. After church service one day, little boy was riding home with his parents. He was just crying. He was crying. Four or five years old, just bawling. See, they'd had baby dedication at the service that day, and they'd ba- they, they dedicated his baby brother. And so maybe the parents were like, what's wrong, Johnny? What's wrong? Nothing. Johnny didn't want to say. Parents just thought, well, maybe it's because all the attention was on his baby brother today. Finally, they said, Johnny, please tell me, what is wrong? Johnny, what's wrong? Johnny looked up at his dad and said, Dad, the pastor said today, Y'all are all committed to raising your kids in a godly home. I don't want to go live somewhere else. (laughs) Funny but sad, right? I wonder. I wonder what would be said of our home. You ought to serve your family. You ought to serve with your family here at your second family. You know what the neat thing about our church is? We are an intergenerational church. So many, five different generations represented here in this congregation alone. I love it. And you know what you ought to do? You ought to find a way to serve with your son or daughter, to serve with your mom or dad, to serve with your brother or sister, Preschool worship, children's worship, kids' ministry, student ministry, Mission One of Robins, greeters, ushers, so many ways, tech and media. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. The sad reality is we've forgotten that ultimately we're designed for worship. and We kind of flip that on its head and say, this has been designed for me. As long as I'm happy and comfortable, as long as my needs are met, as long as the AC is working good and nobody steps on my toes or sits in my seat, then we're okay. God help us. God doesn't exist for our pleasure. We exist for His. And that means whatever He says goes. In the church and in the home, in your marriage, with your kids your family.